So today's webinar is going to be all about advanced editing techniques inside Perfect Effects. We're going to be talking a lot about some of the masking techniques, some of the blending techniques, um, and some of the filters that I think a lot of people forget are there or maybe don't know how to utilize quite as well. We show off some of the bigger filters. Uh, some of our brand new ones like Dynamic Contrast and Sunshine, which I think most of you guys have probably seen, but there are a lot of other filters there that are underutilized. And so I really want to go through and show you guys some of the things that you can do in Perfect Effects that maybe you haven't seen before. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, do not hesitate to ask. There is a questions panel in the GoToWebinar control panel, and you can ask whatever you like, and I'll save the last little bit of time for answering some of those questions. I'm also going to be working through Lightroom today just because I have a collection of a lot of images here inside Lightroom, all the different photos from different folders that I've kind of combined together so that I can edit for this webinar. Everything we do in Perfect Effects today you can do no matter what application you start in. If you're using the program as a standalone through Perfect Browse, Aperture, Lightroom, Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, it does not matter. So don't worry about the fact that I'm in Lightroom. Everything we're going to be doing in effects today can be done universally across the board. Oh, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is masking. And masking is so, so important. It really, really is. And one of the reasons why is because a lot of times you'll end up with a photo where you have very clear and distinct separations. Now, this image here, which I have open, is a convenience store down on the bottom and then a sky up on top. There might be some things that I would want to do to this image as a whole, but there are also going to be a lot of things that I really only want to do to the top to enhance the sky and to the bottom to enhance the convenience store and the bike. So I want to show you some of the ways that you can access the masking techniques inside effects. And we're going to talk about some of the cool little things that will help you mask a little bit better. Let's go ahead and take this into Perfect Effects. So we will edit in, choose Perfect Effects. Just a little side note while I'm going through, I like to mention this. I always suggest that you make a copy of your original photo when you bring it into Perfect Effects. If you are working through programs like Lightroom and Aperture, a lot of times it will prompt you or ask you whether you'd like to create a copy. If you're working in programs like Photoshop or Photoshop Elements, if you started out with a raw file, you're automatically going to have a copy of your original image. The photo suite is not a raw processor, so you don't really have to worry about bringing raw files into the suite and destroying those originals, so that is a plus side. Um, but if you are working with TIFFs or JPEGs, you will want to make sure that you create a copy. And it's just to make sure that in the process, you don't destroy that original photo and you realize that you can't go back. That's a problem that happens all the time. People accidentally destroy their original photos and that can be really frustrating. So, all right. Now, there are tons of different filters on the left-hand side when you open up Perfect Effects and they're separated down into these categories. And each one of these different filters, when you apply it, will automatically have a mask added. You don't have to go through and add masks. They are automatically included. Um, and then all you have to do to activate them is just to paint in or out the areas that you want to add an effect in or remove effect in. So let's start out. I have um, down on the bottom, I want to add quite a bit <clears throat> of detail and contrast to the store and the bike and the road. However, I want to leave the sky up above nice and soft. We want we don't want to add contrast or detail to the sky. This is one of my biggest pet peeves when I look at photos and people add um, tonal contrast and you can see these really kind of unfortunate edges in the clouds in the sky. I think it looks really fake. Um, so I want to make sure that I mask out the top half of my photo. So we're going to start out by using dynamic contrast. And it is one of our most popular filters, but I want to show you how to get rid of it from the top half of the image. Now, the dynamic contrast filter works in a very simple way. I'm going to click on the top filter preset called natural right here. 
And all it's doing is it's adding selective contrast to parts of your image. It's going through and it's separating your photo down into small, medium, and large elements. And it's adding contrast individually to each one of those differently sized elements. Um, it's controlled by the detail section in your filter options pane. And this is where you're gonna make adjustments to it. Now, before we go through, and we make all of our fun filter option changes, I want to just automatically get rid of the sky. It's already starting to look a little weird. The clouds are not looking very nice. The contrast around to the edges are making them look a little funky. We wanna just get rid of the contrast that's happening in the sky. We're gonna edit that, that part later. So there are two different masking tools and you're gonna find them on the left-hand side of Perfect Effects. There's the masking bug, which is a gradient-based mask tool, and then there's the masking brush. Now, the biggest difference between these two is going to be the fact that the masking bug is really great for soft horizons, for creating vignetting effects. So if you had a texture and you just want to apply it to the edges, adding some sort of soft vignette that's even all the way across the board. Now the brush is great if you have very strict lines between areas that you wanna mask in and out. And the brush is actually what we're gonna use for this instance. We don't wanna add a little bit of dynamic contrast. We don't wanna create a gradient between the top and the bottom. We want a harsh line between the sky and the store. Now once the brush is selected up in the tool options bar, you have your mode drop-down menu. This is the most important. This is whether you're painting out and removing an effect or whether you're painting in an effect. And we're going to keep it on paint out because we need to remove it from the top half. There's also a size adjustment, a feathering adjustment, and an opacity adjustment. Now the last one down here at the, the end is called the perfect brush and we're going to end up using this in just a moment. And this is our edge detection brush. Now, one of the great things about using the masking brush is that it comes with a lot of keyboard shortcuts and when you're doing advanced masking techniques these shortcuts are going to save you a lot of time so i want to kind of go through these really quickly now to change the size of your brush you can press the left and right hand bracket keys on your keyboard so that'll make your brush bigger and smaller the shift key on your keyboard and then if you hold the left and right bracket keys that will adjust the feathering around the edge of the brush so we can go through and we can make the brush on a harder edge or a softer edge the last option which is also really nice is the ability to swap your mode by using the x key so when I press the X key on my keyboard, pay attention to this mode menu here. It's swapping from paint in to paint out. So that's gonna end up helping when, when you make a mistake and instead of having to go up here, change your mode menu, you can press the X key on your keyboard and it will change from paint in to paint out. And there's a little minus sign that you're gonna see in the center of my brush right now. That indicates that we're removing something. When I press the X key and it swaps to paint in, you're gonna get a plus sign. So that's a little cheat to remember whether you're painting in or out um, is that plus or minus sign in the center of your brush. Now, we're going to start out and we're just going to click and drag, no perfect brush, across the top half of the sky. And you're going to see that graininess and contrast is getting removed. And you'll also notice that I'm not getting too close down to the edge of the store here. Now, down on the bottom left hand corner of your screen there's a little menu this is our mask view menu and right now it says after which means we're taking a look at our after or our final photo when you open this up you can take a look at your before image this is what we started out with and then you can also view your mask um, there are lots of different ways to view your mask the one that i suggest is called mask red and when we select that it shows a red overlay on top of the areas of your image that are being protected, that are not being affected by this specific filter. So anywhere that you can see your photo is being affected by dynamic contrast. 
Anywhere that has a red overlay is not. Now, the reason why this is really useful is because when I have a very strict line that I need to pay attention to, being able to see what this mask really looks like is going to help. Now, obviously there are gonna be some masks that are, that'll are that be even more difficult than this one. This is a pretty basic mask and I show it off because it, it's very linear and it's very obvious. So it's good for visual learners to kind of understand how this works. It helps me kind of remember how all this works. Um, now, when we come to a line like this one, you can zoom in and out and that'll also help. It's just control or command plus and minus on your keyboard. When you're making very intricate masks, zooming in is gonna help you a lot because it'll, it'll make sure that you're being very exact. If you don't care about being exact, you don't have to do this, but this is a really good way to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to all those little edges. And then the last thing up here that we haven't really talked about yet is gonna be your perfect brush. We'll talk about opacity in a little bit, but for now, the perfect brush is gonna be really, really useful here. Now it separates your image down into color information. So it looks at your photo and it goes, okay, the sky is blue, the walls on the convenience store are red, the bike is red, the bench down here is blue, there's some yellow in the concrete. So it's looking, around and it's going, okay, I'm seeing all of these different colors. So when you use the perfect brush and you click and drag, it's looking at your photo and it's saying, I'm only removing the one color that you're clicking and painting over. So it's not removing the, the red from the convenience store. It's only removing that bright bluish white color from the sky. Just as I mentioned before, and I just want to reiterate this, if you go through and you make a mistake like I just did, you can press either Control or Command Z to undo a brush change. So we can make a couple of different mistakes and we can go through and press Control or Command Z multiple times. You can also click that X key on your keyboard to paint back in the dynamic contrast that accidentally got removed. So you have the ability to do both there. And I think a lot of times people forget about that and it's just, after a while, you get used to using these keys. I always have them written down on a post-it note next to my computer screen to help me remember what all the keys are. Um, but I do do this every day, so I don't need it quite as much anymore. But these keyboard shortcuts are going to save you a lot of time. Now, once you have your mask done, we're, we've got a good mask, we're good to go. You can actually press Control-M on your keyboard. Control M, and that will change your mask mode back to your after image. So Control M on the keyboard is going to change from mask red to your after image. And that's another one of those little keyboard shortcuts that's going to help save some time. So you can view your mask, make sure it looks good, make sure you've got everything in there that you need, and then you can jump back to your after image so you can really see what's going on. Now another one of the reasons why zooming in can be really helpful is if you're working on a just a small portion of your photo, I don't really need to be paying attention to what's happening in the sky right now. I really just need to be paying attention to what's happening down at the bottom. So I'm going to hold down the space bar on my keyboard and use the hand tool to drag my image up a little bit. And now I'm just going to take a look at what the dynamic contrast is doing to the store. So now that we've gone through kind of the basics of kind of the basics and some of the little tidbits of working with masking here, we're actually going to go through and we're going to adjust this filter. Now, as I mentioned before, the dynamic contrast works based on separating down the elements of your photo. So I'm going to move all of these down to zero so we can actually take a look at how they work here. So this is the image that we started out with. This is pretty much, I think this is pretty much straight out of camera. I lightened the shadows a little bit. That was it. But other than that, there really isn't anything done here. And you can see that there's some softness on the edges and the detail in the building, especially in the panes right up at the top. All these details down near where the bike is, everything looks a little hazy. So we're going to start out by adding contrast to the large elements of this section. Now, what's really great about this is we can go. I'm going overboard here because when I zoom out, 
there's nothing happening to the sky. We've already created that mask, so it's already gone through and omitted it, and I don't have to worry about making adjustments to it. So that's kind of one of the plus sides of doing that mask before you go through and make edits, is you don't have to pay attention to that other part of the other part of the photo. Now we're going to go through and we're going to add quite a bit of large contrast here because we really want to make it pop out. So that's going to be our large slider. Our medium slider is going to hit kind of some of those smaller elements, some of the stains in the wood, um, some of the edges that it may have missed in areas like the bench or the vending machine over here. The last slider is your small slider. These are all of the little tiny details in the image. These are a lot of times the things that you don't even see. So you're not gonna see as big a contrast adjustment in your image when you play around with the small slider. The best way to view it is zooming in a little bit. So I'm just kind of pressing Control or Command Plus to make sure I zoom in. And you can watch what happens when I take the detail slider from zero up quite a ways. It's really going in and getting all the, that grit, the lines on the sign, the rust, all the concrete pebbles, all those little tiny things that you barely even notice, that's what the small slider is doing. Um, be careful going overboard with any of these sliders because a lot of times it can start to look a little fake. But playing around with these and finding an adjustment you think works best for you will take some time. Now, the last thing that's really nice about using the dynamic contrast is it has built-in tone adjustments here. So we can do highlight and shadow recovery, white and black adjustments, as well as vibrance. So I'm gonna play around with my whites and my blacks. We're gonna lighten up a little bit in the foreground and darken just a little bit in the foreground there. Not too much because we don't wanna lose all this information but just a couple of points to make sure that I'm maintaining some natural contrast there is important. We'll add just a little bit of vibrance, and there we go. Now, up in the filter stack, we have this mask applied. You'll see I've got my dynamic contrast filter into the right, there's my mask. It's pretty basic, it's very visual, so you can see the top is black, we removed the dynamic contrast from the top, and then the bottom is, is white, which means we made adjustments to the bottom. What's really great is if you spend a lot of time creating a mask, you have the ability to copy and reuse it on the same image. So if I go up to my mask menu, it's up at the top of your screen, you can select the option of copying your mask. And you also have the ability to do things like invert your mask and reset it. Now reset is gonna start it from scratch. It's gonna eradicate everything that you did. Inverting it will swap the black and the white. So instead of applying dynamic contrast to the bottom, when we invert it, it'll apply it to the top. And you can go through and we'll redo that there because we definitely don't wanna add dynamic contrast to the top, but you can see that it's very easy to go through and do that. Now copying your mask means that we can reapply it to another part of our photo. So let's choose copy mask. We're gonna go over to our filter stock and click the plus button. And this time we're gonna go through and we are going to add, let me scroll through, something called a color enhancer. And this is gonna let us adjust the blues in the sky and play around with the hue of it, the brightness of it, and so on. That's gonna be really important to making sure that we have a very dramatic sky. So underneath the color enhancer, there are a couple of different options here. The best one to use if you're just gonna do very basic sky changes to a very boring blue sky, and this is a pretty boring blue sky, um, is an option called darkened sky, and we'll click to add it. Now the biggest thing here is this is a really great addition to add to your photo, but what happens if your sky is blue and then there are other parts of your image that are also blue? Um, we have a bright blue bench, we have a bright blue vending machine, and a couple of other areas that you may not really notice are blue, but are. Um, spots in the windows, even spots in some of the paint have a purplish bluish hue to it. So, it may not seem apparent at first, but adding a mask to this layer is actually gonna be really important. 
And because we copied the dynamic contrast mask, we're actually going to reapply it and invert it for this image here. So I'm going to make a really obvious adjustment to this image so that we can see the mask happening. So I just moved the temperature slider over so it's going to be really, really blatant. Go up to your mask menu. Because we already copied our last mask, we're just going to choose the option of paste mask. It's going to create that same one where it makes adjustments to the bottom. We need to invert it. So we'll go back up to our mask menu and choose invert. This also has a keyboard shortcut. It's controller command I, just in case you want to be able to do that. And there we go. So now we have just an adjustment on the top half of our image. And these kinds of things are going to get a lot easier as you go through and you make adjustments to your photos. So don't be afraid. I know it takes a little while to get used to some of these functions. But once you do, you're going to be pressing the X key to swap pane in and out. You're going to be going through and using your bracket keys to change the size of your brush. You're going to be copying and inverting masks so quickly. Um, now, for this image, we're going to pull that temperature slider back here. I need to adjust the, the color and the intensity of the sky here. Now, down below in the, in the color range section here, in your color enhancer, this separates your photo down into color channels. So we have aquas and blues here, and those are going to be the ones that we adjust. Underneath the blue section, we can change the saturation, so the intensity of the color. We definitely want to saturate it quite a bit more because it is a little dull. We can adjust the brightness of the blue, so we can either lighten it or we can darken it. And then we can change the hue. Now the hue is my favorite because if you're working on blue skies, you can make it more of a teal sky. This is obviously overdone, but you get the idea. Or you can make it more of a purple sky. A lot of times I don't make much of an adjustment. I just push it a little bit in one direction. So for this guy, I wanted a little bit more teal. I'll go through and I'll use that hue slider and push it over to the left a little bit. I want it to be a little bit greener. And there we go. Now it doesn't seem like much that we've done, but we've actually made quite a few, quite a few adjustments here. And you can take a look at your before and after using the preview button down at the bottom. So we can press that on and off, or you can press Control or Command P on your keyboard. So this is what we started out with, our original photo. And this is our after. And because we separated down, we still have a really nice soft sky in the background. And then we have a really like high contrast, high detailed store down on the bottom. The other thing that's really nice about working with your preview is there's a button on the bottom left. It's indicated by an A. This lets you view your before and after side by side. So if you click on this, we can take a look at our original image and our after right next to each other. What's, what can be really useful is if we take a look at this image and then our after, I may think to myself, you know, the color enhancer is, it's, the green is a little overdone. I actually want to make the sky a little bit more purple blue, like the original photo. So I went a little too far with that green blue. I'll take my hue slider on my color enhancer and I'll move it over to the right a little bit. And now I've got more of a purple look. And that, to me, looks a little bit better. So the before and after can be really, really helpful. And you can also make sure that you don't go too far, which can happen very easily. If you press this button a couple more times, you can view a split view, which I think is really, really nice. Uh, top and bottom before and after, depending on whether you're working on horizontal or vertical photos, and a top bottom before and after. The last little thing that also helps when you're taking a look at your preview is the tab key on your keyboard. If you press tab, it hides the left and right hand panels. So you can take a look at all of the adjustments that you have on your image. You can take a look at your filter stack and your filter library. And then you press the tab key and you've got this nice full screen view. And you can pay attention to whether you'd like to make more adjustments to your image or whether you, know, you want to go through and remove something that you didn't necessarily like. All right. So those are kind of, those are going to be a lot of the basics of working with masking and some of those little extra tidbits for being able to view things like your previews and whatnot are really going to help you along the way.
And one of the other things I want to talk to you about are blending modes. And a lot of people don't actually know that blending modes are part of the Perfect Effects program. It's tucked away a little bit, so I think sometimes they get forgotten. But we're going to go through and I want to introduce you how to use blending modes and what, what to use them for and why. So let's jump back and we're going to select our image here and jump back into Perfect Effects. I'm going to create our copy. All right. So blending modes are important. They really, really are. And a lot of times people assume that they're something that you generally use for <clears throat> textures. And a lot of times that is that is what you actually use them for. Um, blending modes change how two different images in a layered based workflow blend together. So when you apply textures, instead of just applying one texture on top of a photo and having it look really weird, you want to overlay that texture so it blends with the underlying image. Now, there are a lot of blending modes. I mean, a lot, a lot of blending modes. And one of the reasons why it's important to understand them is because there are a lot of filters here inside of Perfect FX that can very much be enhanced by using blending modes. So we're going to add the most basic filter of all time. Uh, we're going to add a photo filter. Photo filters are unbelievably awesome, and they get a really, really bad rep. I think it's mostly because people don't always understand how to use them. And I think they're very, very amazing filters if you kind of understand how to blend them into your photos the right way. So we're going to start out with something very obvious just so that you guys can kind of understand the concept of blending modes, and then we'll go in and I'll show you a practical usage for this. So we're going to start out by using the deep red filter. It's going to add just a red filter overlay to the image. On the right hand side in the filter options pane, photo filters are controlled by the color. So you select your filter color here. I can click inside that swatch and I can choose a different color. So let's say we want maybe a, a lighter red. We want it to be a little bit more pink. So maybe not quite as red. We'll make it more pink and we'll brighten it up a little bit. So you can change your color here just by using the select color and we'll click OK. There's also the strength slider, which is how intense you want that color to be. We're going to make it pretty strong just for the, the purposes of this webinar. There's the saturation slider. This is just for the underlying saturation image. Um, so if I desaturate completely, it will just remove color from our original photo, but you'll see it leaves the coral color that we created completely alone. And then one of the last most important things is going to be your polarizer. This acts just like a normal polarizer filter. When I move this over to the right, it's going to create a higher contrast for your photo. A lot of times when you add a filter, it flattens the image out a little bit. So the polarizer is going to help save some of the contrast from your original photo. Now, the mode drop down menu is going to give you four options. And this is like a miniature blending mode drop down menu here. This is how this filter is blending with your photo. And luckily, they actually give you pretty, pretty good understanding of what these are going to do. Strong and subtle are really going to blend the filter into your image instead of it just being an overlay. There's also going to be clean highlights, and clean shadows. Now, we're going to end up using this one called clean highlights because it's going to be a better introduction to understanding how blending modes work. OK, let's do this. So in the filter stack, down at the bottom, there's something called your blending options. And you can open it up just by clicking it. And you're going to get all these different options that you probably haven't seen before. Now, the most important is going to be your blending drop down menu. This is the extended version of the mode drop down menu that you're going to see at the bottom of your filter options. These are more ways to blend this filter into your image. A lot of these are going to be pretty 
basic. They're going to be things that you're, you're going to understand really well. If you've ever used Photoshop or Photoshop Elements, you're going to recognize this list. Now, the best way to understand how they work is to scroll your mouse just through them, and it gives you a preview of what's going to happen if you choose that blending mode. So you're going to see some weird ones. You're going to see some that are going to create these really odd effects. There's going to be some that are going to brighten or darken. There are going to be some that are going to be overboard. Lots and lots of options. The best way to figure out what's going to work best for you is just to scroll your mouse through because most of the time you don't really know what's going to work until you give it a try. Now, some of the ones that I think are the best are color and luminosity. Now, luminosity, you're not going to see a change right now, but color is one of the most important. When you're working with a color-based enhancement on your photo, but you want to make sure that the tones of your image remain the same, so the highlights, midtones, and shadows remain at the same tonal range that you want them to, using the color option is going to change the way that a filter works with your photo. And I'll show you a really good example of that in just a moment. Luminosity will do the opposite. It's going to maintain the, um, the color of your original photo while just adjusting the tone. And because this is a color-based photo filter, you're not going to see a change right now. Um, the other ones that are going to be really, really important are overlay and soft light. These are going to be great for working with textures as well as darken. This is going to choose all of the, the darker pixels from, basically what's happening is it's taking the darker pixels from the pink in our photo filter and it's applying them to the darker tones in our image. Lightness is going to be the opposite. It's taking all of those bright spots in our underlying photo and it's applying pink to them. Multiply is going to be a darker version of overlay, so it's going to blend and darken at the same time. Screen is going to be the opposite. It's going to blend and brighten. Um, and you'll learn how to work with these as you play around with them. Adding things like photo filters, textures, um, split tones, these are great ways to really understand how these different, um, different blending modes work. Now, we're going to end up using one right up at the top called Lighten. And it's taking all of those bright pixels in our image and it's applying the pink and it's leaving our dark black shadows completely alone so there's no color overlay on them. The next thing that you have access to is something called the Apply to drop down menu. And this gives you the ability to apply a, a filter to just one singular part of your image. This is different than a blending mode. Blending modes are universal. They cover the entire photo, no matter what. Um, this lets you choose a very singular part of your image to make an adjustment to. So if we scroll through, there aren't a lot of really bright highlights in our image, so you're not going to see a lot of change here. There are a lot of midtones. So we're going to go through, and the range menu or the range slider is going to adjust the width of midtones, highlights, or shadows that you can add an effect to. So you're going to see as we use highlights, pink is only affecting the highlights in the image, the midtones for the midtone slider, and then the shadows for the shadow slider. You can see how the pink is only affecting each individual channel here. And the, the range is going to affect how tightly it's choosing where the, for instance, highlights are. So when the range goes down, the smaller, smaller section of pink is being applied. As the range goes up, larger amounts of pink are going to be applied. Uh, you can also select things like individual color channels. So we could apply pink to just some of the yellows, and that will affect all of the trees down in the skyline here. We can also choose flesh colors and vivid colors. There aren't a lot of vivid colors in this image, so there's not going to be a lot. Um, neutrals is going to be the one that you mostly end up seeing used. Uh, there are a lot of really flat neutrals in this image, including a lot of the bright area of the sky. And so you have all of these different options here. Now, the last thing down at the bottom of the blending options is going to be your protect section. 
these are different tones or colors that you can protect when you apply a filter. So we just have a normal blending mode. We have nothing applied in the apply to drop down menu. When we use the protect highlight slider, it's going to slowly start to remove the pink from the highlights. When we use the shadow slider, it's going to slowly start to remove the pink from the shadows. The last slider is going to be the skin slider, and this is going to affect anything that could possibly be skin tone. So that's going to include reds, oranges, and yellows. Um, so be careful with the skin slider, but this can be really helpful if you do apply some sort of color-based adjustment and you want to make sure that the skin doesn't get too, too red or too orange or too green or something really weird. The skin slider will help protect some of those tones on someone's face. So each one of these is going to have a, a good reason for existing, and a lot of them can be really, really helpful. If you apply a photo filter and you want to remove it from the highlights, so you get more of this kind of pink look on just the mid-tones or these slivers of hair on the right-hand side of this girl's face, um, these sliders are going to help you. If we want to change how the pink is blending into the image, we want to make sure that it's only applied to the brighter spots of the photo, we can choose Apply To and select Highlights and play around with our range. Um, now, for the practical applications of using something like this, one of the most awesome, let me go up and let me select it here. One of the most awesome ways that you can really see how this works is by adjusting your tone enhancer. And the tone enhancer are going to be basic things that you've probably done to your image before. Um, very simple changes. So there are lots of different filters inside of the tone enhancer. When I show it off, I usually just use the top one called auto contrast and it'll go through and adjust the whites and the blacks. That's really all it's going to do. So I want to talk you through kind of understanding how some of these blending options really can help you out. The tone enhancer, all of the basic sliders are going to be up at the top. Things like brightness, contrast, you've got shadow and highlight recovery, white and black sliders, adding things like detail and local contrast. The thing that makes the tone enhancer so special is actually all the way down at the bottom, and it's something we don't talk about very often. It's called the composite channel, and this is just a, a tone curve. It's a distribution of blacks, midtones, and whites in your image represented on a linear graph hark back to the days of geometry and um, algebra and, and calculus and all those kinds of fun days that you spent in high school and college and you learned all those things that you never thought you were going to use. The, the linear graph here harks back to a lot of those days. It works very similarly to graphs that you may have worked with in the past. But what's wonderful is there really are no words here. There's just color sliders that you're going to see on the left and on the bottom. The highlights are indicated by where the white sections meet up, so white up at the top. Anything that anything on this curve that goes up is going to make it brighter. Anything pulled over to the bottom is going to make it darker. Um, so this little slider that you're going to see on the top on the left and the bottom of the tone curve, this is a good indication of where the distribution of tones are. Down here are going to be your, your shadows. Up here are going to be your highlights. Right in the middle, these are going to be all of your mid-tones. Now, the way the tone curve works is just by clicking and dragging this line to the top and the bottom. So if I click, it's going to add a dot, and that's a point that I can use to adjust that section of the image. So I put it right in the middle. These are all of our mid-tones. Now, one of the reasons why the tone curve is so important is because when I click and drag up to lighten up the image, you see how the curve cur curves? That sounds so silly. You see how the tone curve actually makes that really nice curve from down where the shadows are and up where the highlights are. It lightens up the photo, but it maintains the highlights and the shadows and doesn't over adjust them. When you use something like the brightness slider, we're going to go ahead and do that, and we move that over to the right, it doesn't evenly distribute 
where it lightens and darkens. It has a hard time trying to maintain certain tones in the photo, and it doesn't necessarily do the best job. You'll also see that when we lighten completely, it lightens parts of the photo, but what if I really want to play around with these black shadows? Brightness slider isn't going to do anything. If we darken the image, yeah, it does that, but it's universally darkening the entire photo, including the highlights, including the shadows, including the midtones, everything all at once. So the brightness slider is a little too universal most of the time, and that's when the tone curve comes in handy, because we can click and drag different dots and lighten up just individual sections of the photo. So we'll lighten up our brighter midtones, but then just by adding another dot and clicking and dragging down, we can make sure that we maintain all of those darker shadows and midtones down here. So we're just lightening up a little section of our photo. Uh, you'll hear the word S curve used a lot. And all that means is that you have a nice curve that goes and lightens up the shadows and then lightens up the highlights and darkens the shadows. It looks like a giant S. And it just creates contrast on your image. Um, there's something called a curves adjustment layer inside of Photoshop. This is very similar to that. So you can create that same style of S curve. Now, one of the reasons why, we're gonna go through and we're going to move these around a little bit. We're gonna flatten this out. One of the reasons why this is really important is because if you open up the channel drop-down menu, you can adjust the reds, greens, and blues. And this is how people create things like cross-process effects. And we have a cross-process filter in here, which is really great. Um, but this is going to help sh help me show you a little bit more about how some of those blending modes work and why they're really useful. So when you add an adjustment to, let's say, the red channel, this is just the red section of your image. So that means that it goes from red to kind of cyan, like a greenish blue. When I click and drag up, it's gonna make the image more red. When I drag down, it's gonna make the image more cyan. What we can do here is we can make our highlights more red and our shadows teal, and thus creating a cross-process style look. And we can use the same technique on different channels here. So green is going to be up for green, down for magenta. So we can go up a little bit for green, and then maybe down just a little bit for magenta. And we're creating a cross-process look. Now, one of the things that you're seeing here is we're getting a, a higher rate of contrast in our image. So the lights are going up and the blacks are going down. So you can really see that that shadow is getting a lot darker. We're also getting a lot stranger colors happening here. We're getting these weird teals and greens and, and there's like some weird pinks and magentas in there, which are really odd. In the blending options, back down at the blending end of the blending menu, where the hue, saturation, color, luminosity options are. This is a great indicator of how these work. When we select the color option, you're going to see that the contrast goes away. We still maintain the contrast from the original photo, but now we're just getting these really weird colors. So instead of going with an image that was just high contrast, losing a lot of the detail in the shadows, bright blown out highlights, we're maintaining all of those cool colors, but we're also making sure that we're maintaining our original contrast. The luminosity is gonna be the opposite. What's happening here is it's making sure that it adds all of that awesome, crazy contrast. Those blacks are getting dark, those lights are getting bright. However, the colors are gonna remain exactly the same as our original photo. So now there's no adjustments from the color section of the tone enhancer applied. It's just that crazy contrast. So these can be really, really useful. One of the biggest problems that you're gonna run into when you work with something like contrast on your image is if we apply a lot of adjustments to the whites and the blacks we're going to add a lot of contrast here you'll see that the colors in the image are going to get crazier they're going to get more saturated and more vibrant and this is not always so good especially on portraits of 
pictures of people on portraits because people's skin can look really bad when you add too much vibrance on there. They can get too red or too orange and it can look very odd. So by taking a tone adjustment like this one and changing the blending mode down to luminosity, we're going to maintain our original color information without getting them oversaturated while keeping the new contrast. This is one of my favorite techniques when working on portraits. It's such a great way to make sure that you don't add too much vibrance to somebody, somebody's face. You can always go through and add selective vibrance in parts of your image. That's awesome. But many cases, you want to make sure that you keep it down on a, a lower level. You don't want to go too crazy. And you can always tell when somebody adds too much saturation to an image. It's usually very, very obvious. So this is a good way to make sure that you don't go overboard, if you will. Um, it's one of my favorite little techniques that I use here inside Perfect Effects. And it's something that I probably access, especially when working on portraits. I think it's on about 60 to 75% of all of my portraits um, is this adjustment. So this is kind of one of those little little changes that I make here inside Perfect Facts, one of those adjustments that's really helped me along the way. And it's going to save a lot of your portrait images from looking a little too crazy. The last thing here that can be really helpful is if you apply a large amount of contrast and it's just universal contrast, that's when something like the highlight and shadow adjustment sliders here in the blending options are going to help make sure that you don't get too bright. So we added all this crazy contrast. It's awesome. Woohoo. But the highlights are a little too crazy. Just take the protect slider and move that over to the right and it'll darken them out a little bit. So it'll help remove some of that bright white from the center of the image. But we're still going to maintain all those kind of brighter midtones and really, really dark shadows. So just a little bit of highlight saving there and it's not quite as white in the middle. Um, so these are kind of just different practical uses for, for these blending options. And they're things that I think you'll actually find really useful when you find the image that you'll need it on. And it always pops up. I always find a photo and I can't quite figure out what's wrong with it. And then I play around with some of those blending options and I realize that's really what I was looking for and what I was paying attention to. All right. So we're going to go ahead and remove that. The last Last little thing that I want to show you here inside Perfect Effects before I go through and uh, answer some questions for you guys is your histogram. A, a lot of people forget about what the histogram is and how it works. I'm actually going to add another tone enhancer layer because that'll help illustrate the, the histogram. When you're working with an image that has a lot of darks and lights and you want to make sure that you don't over brighten over darken, that you don't lose too many highlights or lose too many shadows, the histogram is going to come in handy. It's up in the top right hand corner. And when you select it, you're going to see this really weird array of peaks and valleys. This is a distribution of the colors and tones in your photo as displayed on this histogram. Um, and that's what all those peaks and valleys are. It's showing you on the left hand side and the right hand side, all of the lights and the darks. Now, there are two very small triangles up in the top right-hand corner. Hopefully, you can see them. I'm kind of circling them a little bit. They're very small. But these triangles, when you click on them, it shows something called your clipping mask. Anywhere in your image, and I'm going to add a little bit of contrast here just so that I can really show you guys how this works. Um, anywhere in your image that you see blue pixels, so you see all those weird blue pixels that are over the silhouette? Those are solid black pixels. There is no information there at all. Those are black. That's it. There's, there's nothing there. Anywhere that you see red pixels, those are solid white areas of your image. Those are blown out highlights that are so bright that they're just white. So blue, black, solid black shadows, red, solid white highlights. Now, what's nice about using this is it's a good way to help make sure that you're maintaining contrast without losing information. Obviously, this is a silhouette image, so having a little bit of black is totally fine, but the, the whites are way too blown out, and so I may want to be more careful in my tone enhancer section about playing around with my white slider. Now, obviously, I did that for the indication of the webinar. That was a little too crazy, but if you've got some spattering of red here, you can move that white slider to the left until you pull back just enough 
so that there's a much smaller amount of blown out red pixels. If there are too many dark shadows, I could take my shadow recovery slider here and move that over to the right, and we could see if we can maintain some information there. There aren't going to be too many because a lot of these pixels, this was shot so that it would be a silhouette. Um, so a lot of those black pixels are going to remain the same. But it's really letting me know that I'm not going to go overboard when I increase or decrease contrast, increase, decrease whites and blacks, or brightness. Um, so this is one of my favorite kind of helpful little hints, especially when I'm working on landscapes because it helps me make sure that I'm not going to have any areas that are so bright or so dark that I'm going to lose all that information that I spent all that time on my camera trying to make sure that I, I maintained. Um, so the histogram is very helpful and you can take a look at it to really see the distribution of whites and blacks, but these little triangles on the top and the bottom, just by clicking them on and off, you're going to be able to see that clipping mask and that's going to really help you with your tones and your image. Um, and this is for every single photo. If you turn these on and you don't see anything, that means you don't have any lost pixels. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, but if you do see them, you can go through and you can make adjustments accordingly.